Welcome to Numerical Methods. So we are in a section on the Monte Carlo method. So now about interpretation, getting an intuition, how the Monte Carlo method is achieving its convergence rate in higher dimension. So in particular, how the Monte Carlo method and its probabilistic nature breaks the curse of dimension. So just recall, we are looking at the Monte Carlo integral here of a function that is here on the d-dimensional hypercube. We like to approximate this d-dimensional integral. And we have a convergence rate, which is of the order one divided by square root of n. The dimension does not appear in this, but the thing is that all this holds only in probability. And this is maybe a bit unsatisfactory yeah, because what we are doing is that we are evaluating this sequence at a single point of my IID sequence. So a single event. You cannot heal this by, say, using more points. Yeah, because either using more points improves the error estimate or it improves the probability. Yeah. By using twice as many points, you can move the probability level yeah, from delta to delta half. Yeah. You also you can improve the probability that you have achieved the given accuracy or you can improve the accuracy by a factor of one divided by square root of two. The probabilistic nature remains. But the probabilistic nature breaks somehow the curse of dimensionality. And for this, compare now the Simpsons rule, error estimate in higher dimensions. So the Simpsons rule, error estimate in higher dimensions is one divided by n to the power of four divided by d, compare this to our Monte Carlo integral error estimate, which is one divided by n to the power of one half. So you see when the dimension becomes larger than eight, Monte Carlo becomes more efficient. We have a constant here in front this constant C for the Simpsons rule yeah, is given here. And this constant relates to the variability of the function. This constant, the constant C for the Monte Carlo method is given here. Yeah, but it also relates to the variability of the function. Okay, so how do we get the thing that there is no dimension here? So this is actually related to the probabilistic nature. And to see this, consider the following case. I have a function in two dimensions. So I have a function in two dimensions. I would like to integrate here my on my cube, say from zero to one. 0 to 1. I would like to integrate this function. Consider the iter iterated integrals. Mm -hmm. So define the g of x2. So you would fix here an x2. And you just integrate in this direction to get the g of x2, which is integrate over x1. This is a one-dimensional integral. And then the integral of f is integrate all your g's. 
So then we integrate the g's to achieve uh, to arrive at the integral of f. If we do this with a classical integration rule, actually we are building the Cartesian product of our evaluation points. So we consider points. If we consider m integration points for the inner integral, actually we have m times m, m squared integration points. Example, yeah, we already had this example in the exercise. The Riemann sum, yeah, the Riemann sum uses center points. Okay, so if you have four intervals, four intervals, yeah, you use one, two, three, four sample points, and you use these sample points in every dimension, yeah, you also use it. Here, okay, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So this would be the Riemann sum. So you evaluate here on this Cartesian product. And you have m squared, n equals m squared sample points. So this looks very similar to what you do in the Monte Carlo integral. You just average over sample points. The only difference is that this is a very regular placing, while the other placing is random. Uh, well, okay, a regular placing is maybe much better. Huh? There is less space between the points, right? It's maybe a kind of optimal placing, yeah? this regular placing. So if you recall, I had a small experiment that did a two-dimensional sampling when I was describing how we generate a two-dimensional random variable out of a sequence of one-dimensional random variables. So this was how this two-dimensional sample sampling looked like. Yeah? So this is now here my sampling of the unit cube 0, 1, 0, 1 with random points. And you see the randomness creates some empty spaces here. So maybe this regular sampling it should be maybe better, right? The randomness, the unstructured evaluation points, this is not a bug, this is a feature. So now to illustrate this, consider the special case where the function that we integrate does not depend on x2. So what does this mean? So this means all these integrals here, if it does not depend on x2, they are actually the same. So I'm always calculating here the same integral. They are all the same integral because the function f does not depend on x2 and they are all this integral. Yeah? So this is now my function, say, h here. And they are all the function h integrated. Well, all these integrals, they use the same evaluation points. So... You see that in the left picture, I use 16 evaluation points, 4 squared, 4 times 4. But I'm calculating the integral h with only 4 evaluation points. So this thing is using 16 points, but we approximate this integral with only four points. So a lot of these points are just wasted. Huh? So you see my accuracy is related to one divided by four, but I'm using 16 points. Yeah, We already discussed this. Yeah, The error of the one-dimensional thing remains. Yeah, maybe you think now, okay, I have a clever idea. Why not use for every x2 component different x1 components. 
this is not not a, not such a stupid idea. So if you move from this picture to this picture, that you shift all the x1 components depending on the x2 components. So your sample points are now a little bit different. I use separate sample points x1 tilde x2 tilde i, where the x1 component is given by shifting the previous x1 component depending on x2. So here this a yeah, is just this uh, slope here that you see. So we shift with a, with a certain slope here, okay? So I do some kind of shifting. Uh, yeah, modulo one, yeah, if you move out on the other side, you move in here if you like. So you have a different way of sampling the points. Then this implies that we use now 16 points in the X1 component. So this uses 16 points in X1 to approximate the integral. Obviously, for the case where f does not depend on x2, this will give me a much better approximation. Yeah? Approximation error will be like using 16 points. Yeah, this does not heal the problem because now I can come up with a function f that does not depend on actually the value on these lines. So if now the function f that only depends on my shifted x1 component, so the function f is constant along these lines, actually now you have the same problem. Yeah? You are always calculating the same integral yeah? because you always have the same function evaluation values yeah? um, if you take even now these shifted points. It's also now just as using only four evaluation points. Okay, and for that function, my integration rule also just has an accuracy that is related to order, you know, related to order one divided by the evaluation points. So the power of something, depending on which integration rule you use, but it is just uh, order of the number of evaluation points in one dimension. You know? So in, in this one dimension, I just have four points. Um, so again, I have the course of dim dimensionality. And of course, the error estimate that we give, it should hold for all possible functions. Yeah. So, of course, if you know special properties of the functions, then maybe you have a more intelligent way of placing the points. But the integrator, my integrator here, doesn't make any assumption on the function, except that it maybe knows the function has to be evaluated on a certain domain. So now look what happens in the Monte Carlo integration. The Monte Carlo integration places the points randomly, but placing the points in higher dimension randomly means that every component of the point, so every dimension is chosen randomly. So if you look at Monte Carlo, you have that every projection along the line would give you the 16 point. So the probability that a component you know, or another projection that you like creates the same value is zero. This is a probabilistic thing. Yeah? So you sample every component and by this you have the result that the probability to hit the same component again is zero. So you see that if you place the points randomly, you would get the 16 points in this example where the function does not depend on x2, but you also get the 16 points in the example where the function does not depend on the value along these lines. 
you see also that the random nature creates some gaps or creates some clusters. So if you would have an evenly spacing, you would get a Riemann sum an order one divided by n. So it's it is this um, these gaps that reduce a little bit the convergence rate. So we get not a one divided by n, we get a one divided by square root of n. Yeah? So these gaps are a little bit the price. Yeah, they, so they they come from having a variance. Yeah, the price that we pay. But the randomness now gives us this very nice feature that we never hit the same value again in the sense that we never hit the same component again. So to comment this here, the probability to hit the same component again is zero. So this is component-wise, yeah? So you also see that creating this IID sequence of vector-valued random variables with IID components, so by filling the components yeah, from a one-dimensional sequence, this is also linked to it. Yeah, The components are independent, so we sample in every dimension independent. So you see that the probabilistic nature is here at work in breaking this curse of dimension. So this is a small summary. Yeah, now it looks as if we need the probabilistic nature. It's not a bug, it's a feature. It is the one that enables this property yeah, of breaking the curse of dimension. But the funny thing is that there is a theory, the quasi Monte Carlo method, yeah, the low discrepancy sequences that allow us to generate sequences that have this property without being random. So these are the low discrepancy sequences. And there we get an almost independency of um, the dimension. So there is a little log factor still involved. And um, this is now the reason that we need to study random number uh, generation yeah, in the next section. So we, we can get rid of this probability in the convergence rate in the error estimate. That was it for the Monte Carlo method. Random number generation is the next section. Thanks.